goes back to the point John made at the beginning of it, is that cities you know, across the country have common challenges. And um, you know, some of the work I think that we're going to do today can be helpful not only for people in Toronto, but for people uh, in other cities uh, who are facing similar uh, budgetary issues. And we've certainly got lots of opportunities to learn uh, from what other cities are doing. And uh, groups like John's are you know, trying to, 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 to work hard to identify those best practices and, and allow cities to, to come together and learn from each other. Um, so I'm just going to call Joe Snyder, who's going to be the, uh, the moderator for our panel on the politics of budget. And uh, Joe is the uh, director of media and communication at the Wellesley Institute and is also a very multi talented person whose expertise includes not only uh, budgeting but also publishing. She's got a lot of experience in the arts. Uh, she uh, was the publisher of Shameless Magazine, which was an award-winning magazine working with teen girls and trans youth. And uh, we worked together extensively on the first Better Budget Day. So I'm very pleased to have Jo part of the team, and she'll be moderating this panel, which I'm really looking forward to. So welcome, Jo. Warming everyone up. Does everyone have coffee and everything that they need before we get started with the next little bit? Um, so, as Alex said, I'm Joe Snyder, and um, we're all here today because we see something in budget processing that we want to be a part of. We all want to be engaged in our city, and thankfully, this is a beautiful space, so it doesn't really feel like we're locked in a room when it's beautiful outside because we can see it. So, I'm happy about that too. So, I'm going to welcome our panel. I see that everybody's here. So Jesse, Ford, and Mike, you want to come on up to the stage and have a seat? And I'll introduce everybody. I think we have some mics to hand out, too. <laughs> Mike's just telling me this is the first time I've ever been in the center. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the group. Oh, that's awesome. And why don't we? Uh, I'm just going to get right into it, and I'm going to introduce our panel. Maybe I'll start there with uh, Councillor Gord Perks. Uh, Gord Perks was elected to represent Parkdale High Park in 2006. He has a solid record on environmental initiatives that began in 1987 with such environmental organizations as Pollution Pro, Greenpeace Canada, the Better Transportation Coalition, and the Toronto Environmental Alliance. He's the principal author of the Canadian Green Consumer Guide. And in his work as city councillor, Gord's priorities investing in public space, protecting library services, community centre programs, and providing more green space within the ward. But his vision for the city extends beyond his ward's boundaries. He's led the fight to get the TTC to adopt the ridership growth strategy, of making Dufferin King and Queen Priority Streets for improved transit service. And he's fundamental to the expansion of the City of Toronto's Blue and Grey Box program sits on the Parks and Environment Committee, Subcommittee on Climate Change, Mitigation and Adaptation, Tribunal Nominating Panel, Toronto Atmosphere Fund Board of Directors, among others, and we're happy to have him here. Welcome, Councillor Perks. We also have Mike Del Grande, TDSB Trustee for Ward 7, and Chair of the Board after serving three consecutive terms as Toronto Councillor, City Councillor for Ward 39. While at City Hall, Mike was appointed Budget Chief as Chair of the Budget Committee and member of Toronto Police Services Board. He initially served as Trustee for Ward 7, and he held position as Chair of the Bylaws Committee, the Vice Chair of the Human Resources, Programs and Religious Affairs Committee, and as the Board's Honorary Treasurer. He's a former Chartered Accountant and a graduate of the University of Western Ontario and the University of Toronto, with degrees in Commerce and Theology, and thank you for joining us as well. And from out of town, we have Jesse Helmer, who was sworn in as a city councillor for Ward 4 uh, just in December in London, Ontario. In addition to serving on council, he's the vice president at Ground Force Digital, a company that designs and produces websites and trains people how to use digital tools effectively. Uh, Jesse serves on several committees, boards, and commissions, including but not limited to civic works, planning and environment, strategic priorities, and policy. Uh, he's been involved in a variety of campaigns, including provincial and local policy crowdsourcing initiatives and a national campaign for a basic income pilot. He's a self-described policy wonk. I read that on the internet. Is that true? Uh, and we're glad he's here, so thanks for coming today. We're looking forward to having you in the discussion. 
So I'm going to lead off with a question, and I'm going to ask everyone to answer it for a couple minutes, and then we'll go into a couple of questions from me, and then we're going to open it up to uh, everyone else. So the lead off question, and we'll start with our guest, out of town guest, Jesse. Uh, what should the public know about how the budget works? Um, is that one? Can you hear me? Um, so what should the public know? Um, I think the most important thing is, to, and there was a slide up here about the timeline for the budget. Um, and the sooner you get involved in the budget process, the better. Oftentimes, uh, I've seen the public uh, comes into the process very late, and at that point, um, uh, you might be able to move a few dollars around here or there to particular projects, but a lot of the bigger decisions have already been made, and, uh, and I think the sooner you get involved in the budget process, uh, the better. And, and I don't see, and I, I would say, it's interesting, we have uh, Nenshi on there, talking about their multi-year budget process. I don't see the budget as something that starts and finishes. The budget is always on point. If you're not working on this year's budget and passing it, you're going to be working on next year's budget and passing it. It's a constant process of, of allocating resources. So um, whatever it is that you're interested in and whatever you'd like to do and see change in the budget, um, the time to get involved is always now. And I, I think the sooner you get, you get involved and start advocating for what you'd like to see, uh, the better. So I think uh, Jesse pretty much nailed it. Um, I, I think there's a fetish around uh, budget time, the budget debate, it's all very exciting, it's about tax rates and services, and it looks like an awful lot is going on. In fact, almost nothing is going on except contesting those last few decimal places. In the last several budgets at the City of Toronto, between the public release of the budget and the final council de debate, maybe 10 or 20 million dollars changes. That's on 10 billion. So it's 0.1% of the changes. The real discussion about how we allocate resources as a society, what we prioritize, what level of service we want, and how we're gonna pay for it, is actually something that takes place well before we're in the budget process. Right now at Toronto City Council, we're about to make a decision. If we go one way, it'll cost half a billion. If we go another way, it will cost a billion. That will greatly affect how much money is left over for libraries, daycare, and things that many people in this room have talked to me about. If we wait until we're in the budget process, it's over, you lost. You're just gonna get the highway and not the daycare. And if that's what you want for the city, fine. Wait to take part in the budget process. If you wanna have a conversation about how we allocate resources socially, how we pick those projects we want to do together as a society, you have them outside the budget process. You have them in organizing for housing, organizing for daycare, organizing to make sure that the services in your community are the ones you want. Mike, do you have anything to? Well, strangely, I, I agree with my good friend here on my right. Well, good, we're starting off with the The only time you'll ever see it, folks. <laughs> um, I kind of take a different kind of approach, which is more singular than it is collectively, because collectively there are a lot of flaws with the budget process. And what I mean uh, by that is that the word up there was politics and budgeting. And if I had an I wish, I'd like to remove the word politics and put the word policy, budgeting. I think it's more apropos. We don't do that. Um, I would view that the opportunities would be for us to determine policy-wise what are the things that we want to do and how do we want to prioritize them and, and more importantly what outcomes do we want to see and I think that's one of the things that escapes us um, in any budgeting process. I'm doing a budgeting crisis problem for the uh, Toronto Catholic Board. It's the outcomes. So let me give you an example. Uh, we may say for example, that um, unemployment for young people is very high. And everybody would agree with that. And some would say, well, we need to you know, provide more money, et cetera, for that. I would kind of take a step back and I would say the following. When I do a budget, and let's say I've got $1.1 million to allocate, 
Um, and it just so happens that there's one organization that gets the bulk of the, the million dollars. And they've been around for 20, 30 years you know, they're doing their thing. But then when you take a closer look and you compare it to the organization that got $100,000, you might find that the organization that had a million dollars um, was generating jobs for 100 young people. And the organization that had $100,000 might have been providing 200 jobs. And so because we get into the rut that it appears on the, on the line that we're going to fund this, it's been around for 20 years, so we're just going to continue to add to it, I think does a disservice from the point of view of limited resource dollars and from the point of view of what our policy objectives are in terms of outcomes. So, you know, we get into the battle about, you know, do we fund this particular group missing the overall picture of perhaps we need to reallocate the resources that we are spending in this activity from this one group and move it to the group that is showing better outcomes. Because when you do that, then you force the group that's been around for 20, 30 years that has become lethargic, that isn't really focused on understanding that the dollars are limited and the dollars can change. If there's a belief that the dollars aren't going to change, then the behavior continues in the same methodology. So I, I just, you know, I'm kind of the odd person out here. In terms of um, that's where I'd like to see all budgeting go, but because we're caught into the political side of things, we tend to get into battles about all kinds of things, and yet really, we may want to be at the same point, except we need to define it better, and we need to allocate the resources in a more appropriate manner. So if it's a, so if it's a, a policy objective, like the budgets have a policy objective, and we're talking about engagement and how uh, long the budget <coughs> process is, and maybe, or Jesse, you can speak to this, how does the public, um, how does the budget process be improved <coughs> Uh, to be more democratic and to have more public engagement, and how could how could the public have input into it from a policy point of view? Well, um, there are two levels operating here. One is one is the sort of long term conversation we're having of what governments are for, right? And one of the we're talking about budgets and politics. I actually think budgets are political; they're not about policy. Uh, the policy conversation is an ongoing thing. And given that, you know, we, we've been, we talk all the time in, in groups like this, uh, with our families, with our co-workers, with people in, in uh, civil society organizations we belong to, but the kind of society we want, we go out, we elect people, that's all setting the stage for how we allocate resources. And as Jesse and I, and Mike to a degree said, by the time you get to the actual budget, you're into the, the screwdriver work, right? A little tiny bits. So given that we're only doing the screwdriver work, why does the debate turn on, well, uh, you know, the tax rate's too high, or we don't have enough daycare, or whatever. These debates happen during the budget, even though we're not actually fixing those things during the budget. So in many ways, a, a budgeting process, and this is even more true at a federal or provincial level, is about uh, how you talk about society. It's an opportunity for uh, some members of our, our body politic to say taxes are too high, even though that's not what you're really doing during a budgeting process. It's an opportunity to make the case for daycare. So Mike's quite right. It's not actually about policy. The policy work has all been done, right? You're not suddenly going to spring a, a large new expensive program during the middle of a budget process. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, the only time I've ever seen a big change happen uh, was 2008-9 uh, when we were going through the global financial crisis. I was on that budget committee and we had to move a lot of money around real fast because we, we, we were terrified seeing the numbers starting to come in on our um, social assistance caseload and that was gonna cost a lot of money. We had to figure out how to cover it. Largely budgeting is political. It is only about you have this object in front of you, which is the financial plan for the year. It's a contest in how you describe it. And in that moment, I think those of us who believe that 
governments are a force for good in the world, they're the way that we do things together, we have to not be shy about describing that budget as a way that we're all investing together and as a place where we've missed opportunities to invest together and how we're going to have to get it right next time. Do you have anything to add? I would say, I mean, it, it depends somewhat how your municipality is, is proceeding with the budget process. You know, in, in London, um, we're starting to shift more and more of the public engagement to the front end around priority setting and uh, what kind of outcomes people are interested in. So I'll give you an example. In, in the last budget we went through, um, each of the service areas we have in the municipality has key performance indicators. None of the discussion uh, during the budget process was about what should those key performance indicators be and are they appropriate, should they be different. Uh, nobody, nobody came to us to talk about that. Everyone came to talk about, I think this organization should get more money or this area of, of the municipality should have more money. So it wasn't focused, and this is I think what um, Trustee Del Grande was getting at. It's not focused on the discussion about what kind of outcomes are we trying to achieve. It's it's one step removed from that. And, and I think shifting the public engagement earlier to say, what are the most important priorities? Um, and we're doing that in London. We, we just went through, we had a new council elected. We had 11 of the 15 councillors are new. That's a lot of new people. Um, and we are doing, a, we just finished our four year strategic plan. The strategic plan is informing our multi year budget, which we're starting to draft now. So that'll be for the next four years. And a lot of the consultation is front end loaded on what are the priorities you want to see for the next four years. In the past, what would the public engagement would come in, in sort of last two months of the budget. Um, and I, I think that is, as has been repeated a couple of times, a very small changes are happening at that point versus at the front end. If, if there's a strong movement, for example, to say we really want to end homelessness in our community, uh, then you're going to have a significant shift of resources that would be required to accomplish that and then that would feed into the budget. So if that comes out as the public's number one priority in the city, uh, I think we'd see a much more substantial initiative than if we had it in our previous budget where the budget for homelessness prevention came through and it was not changed at all, it was the exact same as it was here before. Even though that is an identified priority in the community, no change happened. So building on that and uh, for Gordon and Mike, what does success look like for you in getting input from constituents on the budget and informing them about the budget? Well, success for me isn't about who screams the loudest. Um, success for me is um, being able to have the view broaden in terms of we're focused because of our background, because of who we are and where we come from, et cetera, different life experiences. So our focus is somewhat in this. And what the public does is, is open it up for us, that something that we didn't experience or didn't understand or didn't, didn't appreciate, bring it to our attention to say, oh yeah, um, I didn't think about that, right? I didn't you know, take into consideration this particular um, concern. Um, for example, uh, the police budget, and by the way, I, I wonder whether I've been away a, a long time because the DTC budget got bigger than the police budget and always I was the police budget was the largest. So, um, first time in the history of um, the amalgamated police that they ended up with a zero budget increase. And let's remember the all the arguments about well, um, we've never ever ever denied the police whatever amounts of money they wanted because you know, God forbid, uh, people be shooting each other on the street continually and it's gonna be terrible and yada, yada, yada. But nobody ever asked the question to say, well, how many police officers does it take to police the city? Where did you come up with the number? And strangely enough, there wasn't an answer to that. It was politically, somebody decided it should be 5,600 or somebody decided we're gonna give the police uh, another 100 more bodies and we're going to subsidize that at $36,000 per. And that amount gets frozen and then you've got to make up the differences. Gordon well knows when we give the 75-25% uh, rules and then they don't live up to the 75%. We, we end up putting in practice the, the policies that are imposed upon us. So when you have people that come and say, well, Councillor, um, why are we spending so much money when 
part of that money could go into playgrounds where kids could have something to do so they don't become caught in the system, et cetera. And you sort of like take a step back and you say, gee, that was a very good point. I didn't consider that point. So I think that's where the public comes in, is to offer that, off the questions, force us to answer them, and also to provide a different view. But in terms of the process, I mean, how are, you know, where's the evidence of the public being heard when they're trying to inform these kinds of processes? And ideally, what, what does that look, look like? Well, uh, ideally, in the 24-hour <laughs> marathons, you would think that uh, people would come forward uh, with legitimized, what I call legitimized, rather than uh, a bunch of process at point became a circus, uh, where people were doing so well. I can't <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're really sincere about what you want to do and how you want to do it on both sides of the equation, the public and, and the policy makers, then you have to have some real honest, sincere dialogue and, and not, again, turn it into a political something or other. And so, you know, I, I can say to you that I felt that every possible avenue, whether it be at the school board or be at the city hall, there's been more public consultation than there's ever been public consultation. But again, to listen, uh, to the consultation doesn't necessarily make it so that because someone said you should do this, that you have to do this. Because you have to balance all those things with various interests, with various um, policies, with various outcomes, and at the end of the day with the money that you have. If I could, to pick up on, on that. So imagine one day you and your significant other are sitting down saying, you know, we should really take six months off together. We need that time, we need to get away from working every day, and we need to go see the world or, or do something, right? And, and you say, yeah, that's a good idea. You don't do it then. You don't just drop your work. You figure out, okay, now we have to plan for that. We have to put aside some money, we have to figure out how we're gonna get the time off work. The, the, the Deputations you come and make uh, during the budget process, the, the, the public protests you do, the organizing you do, the fights you do around the 2015 budget don't mean that whatever it is you're advocating for will happen at that council meeting when we set that budget. What it does is, as Mike was saying, communicate an idea, be part of a conversation that's going to lead to changes in future budgets. There's a, a, a strange, uh, I don't know, a, a perception. If, if you go and you make Mike stay up all night or you come and protest me that I'm putting your taxes up too high or whatever it is, that that's gonna fix it that day. That's not how it works. The beauty of the open municipal system is you do have all the information in front of you, like in, in details. Mike and I both love, he, he probably, shredded his, have collections of city budgets going back over a decade. And all of that information is available to you and it's a tool that you have for making the to-do list for the next budget. Planning when you're gonna get that six month vacation or when you're going to stop the investment in, I don't know, highways and <laughs> instead um, make investments into something else. You don't decide that in the moment, it's about starting the civil conversation about the kind of city you want each time. It's an iterative process. Um, so one thing I would add, and I, I think this is the piece of budgeting that is, is very difficult, and I think where there's area, areas where we can improve, which is um, often when people come forward with a new idea or something new that they think should get more, more resources, they don't identify something else that should get less resources. So that puts a lot of pressure constantly on the tax uh, levy, and, and you're always saying, the conversation is always, I don't want taxes to go up, or I want this thing to happen. And, and you get into a, a bit of an unproductive conversation between people who really don't want taxes to go up and people who want new things to happen. Um, 
the bigger shifts in resource allocation will only happen if we identify areas where we're going to disinvest and stop doing things that we've been doing for a long time. So you have to identify, there's lots of good things that the city could be doing. Uh, what are the most important things? How, is thing, how have things changed over the past two decades? Why should we continue doing what we've been doing in the past? I know a lot of these things are mandated. I mean, there's not that much flexibility in some of these things, but there is some. And unfortunately, there's very little work done by the public to identify areas where they say, you know, like, what is going on in the roadways? Like, why does it cost $15 million to widen part of one road um, and, and push back on some of the process and, and, and decisions that are being made on some of the very big areas of expenditure? Um, and, and I think if, if the public focused a little bit more on areas where there could be some disinvestment, uh, that's obviously a difficult conversation, but it allows for more change to happen. And I'll tell you, I looked over 10 years of municipal budgets in London. If you look at the percentage of the budget that's spent on different service areas over time, uh, it's virtually unchanged. The only changes that have really been happening in Ontario works uploading to the province, a greater in our municipality, a greater expenditure on the capital levy, so we're paying for more of our capital work as we go instead of borrowing. Um, the police and fire are taking up all the space that's, that's been taken, uh, that's been made available by the Ontario Works Uploading. So, Otherwise, all these other service areas is pretty much the same uh, percentage of your budget as it was in 2003. So, uh, so, oh, so, so I, I think if, if you're looking to make really big changes and to speed things up, you really have to look at where should you be disinvesting and not just always the thing you want to see more. So that presents a bit of an interesting challenge that might come up in our discussions this afternoon. It might come up on the table too about the level of sophistication that, that people are expected to understand about the budget to have a meaningful, to have meaningful input in the budget from the public, and that might come up in how the public is engaged and informed and, and those kinds of things. I don't know if that is agreement on that or... Well, there is and there isn't, right? Uh, it's, um, frankly, I think some of what we do at the City of Toronto is to deafen people which too, with too much noise. Um, honestly, I, I know even, even among city councillors, very few people actually read all of those analyst notes. <laughs> very, very few. <laughs> There's Janet Davis. There was Mike Delgron. Um, Shelley Carroll and me. So no one else, right? So there's four of us. And I think David Haynes one year braved his way through them. Um, so very few people read all of it. Um, and, and that, that in itself is disempowering, right? I think though that there needs to, and I, it's, it's, Jesse said something that I think is interesting, which is um, people don't talk about what we shouldn't inv invest in, but also there's the group of people who want to do more and the group of people who don't want taxes to go up. I think that kind of conversation is the one that doesn't happen vigorously and thoroughly enough. So everyone, everyone thinks their taxes are too high, right? No, taxes are going down. They've been going down at every level of government for well over a decade. Since amalgamation, the property tax rate in the city of Toronto has gone down by 12.5%. 12.5%. Now, we've had some other income, the land transfer, but that barely covered the downloading that we got. We have been cutting your services in the guise of keeping below inflation for a decade and a half. And what survives there are the things that we're legislatively required to do and emergency services. That's what survives in that environment because no elected official ever wants to be the guy who closed the fire department or the fire station next to the place where the lethal fire happened or who reduced the number of beat cops just before the fatal shooting at the Eaton Center. No one wants to be that person, right? Because not a lot of the decisions we make are, are life and death that way. They're about the slow life and death of the city, whether you invest in public spaces, whether you invest in equity. And to get that kind of stuff, I think we need to stop drowning in the numbers and start talking again about the value, values. Every, every year it drives me nuts. It's, it's like watching a bunch of robots walking around City Hall. I think 2.5, no, I think 2.2, no, 2.5, no, 2.3. It's like being at an auction. 
has nothing to do with establishing the kind of city you want to live in at all. So let's not drown in the numbers about budgets. Let's remember that budgets are a snapshot evaluation of what values we hold and keep talking about values, values, and values. Uh, are there some questions from the floor? And where is our gentleman, the other guy? We'll start here, and I'll, I'll grab questions uh, for anyone that. Okay. Do you, are you going to take a microphone? Um, I'll just I'll, I'll yell. I don't think we I, we don't have a spare mic. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, uh, last year's election in London. I don't know if the word seismic shift is appropriate, but when it began, um, I think it was doubtful that you would get the result of a one-term councillor, Matt Brown, being elected the way that he won, how he won. But part of the process was that he went on his listening tour and he said that he would have a plan, the London plan. So he went about doing that by listening to everybody and then announcing it when he was ready uh, before the election, and that helped him. Was that uh, effectively an open budget process where he was listening to everybody, asking what their priorities were, and bringing that into council for your four-year plan? And does that inform, like, is that what happened? Like, or was it just a thing to get elected? So Matt made being open and listening to be a part of his uh, campaign. And uh, when I was on the stage when he announced that I was supporting him and some obviously support of um, That's not so much about the budget. So the London plan is a new official plan for the city, all about land use planning. It's a bit different than the normal official plan. Um, this is why uh, people refer to it, part of his branding, we called it something different, we don't call it the official plan. Um, but it really is not connected to Budget, and the budget is really the strategic plan, which is obviously aligned with what's in the London plan, and then our multi year budget process that's happening there. But we, we have that same kind of attitude amongst many of the colleagues on council in terms of engagement with the public. That's something that was quite common, especially when we meet people who are elected. Uh, there's some more questions. Great. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. You said that, not, that um, budgeting is not clinical. Budget is political. You, you, you bring in a budget to fit people who you listen to in certain groups, constituents you don't listen to. So, and also, um, like, look at all the money going to Scarborough subway. When a lot of people say that's not necessary. Look, at it does it necessary? And number two, you lose money, it's supposed to be going to make um, accessibility and priority in front of housing, no, the TTC. That money was taken away from um, the council, even though it was required. And so, how can you say nothing is political? Everything you do is political. No, I, I said I wish I could take the word political and make it policy. I didn't say it wasn't political. That's part of the problem. So my I wish is that we should remove the politics side of it and focus on the policy side of it. That was my statement. If I could just give a different view. Um, I actually think it's a good thing that governments do politics. Duh. Right? That's what we're for. Can I just do a quick little test? How many people in this room are ideologues? One, two, three. Okay, how many people think it would be a good thing if Stephen Harper went on television tomorrow and announced he was indefinitely suspending elections and was gonna govern for life? Not very many. Now, the reason you know that that would be a bad thing isn't something that you got from your understanding of physics or biology or some scientific thing. You got that because you have ideas about what constitutes a good government, because you have an ideology. It happens to be the ideology of democracy. So let's try again. 
How many people here are ideologues? Everybody, <laughs> right? We all bring ideas to Paul to how we want to be governed and the process of those ideas competing and contesting to, uh, uh, so we can figure out together how to shape our society. That's politics, be proud of it. Yeah, that's my lecture. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bast. Um, I have a question for all panelists. Uh, I'm wondering, next budget cycle, what's one intervention or one thing that if it happened, you would be, you would know that the budget process is getting better? So short of a total reimagination and an overhaul, uh, while you think of that, I'll just offer that I think we heard one idea from Jesse when you said, you know, you don't hear, you hear more of something, but you don't hear less. So. Maybe one example is people presenting more trade-offs and rationale through their deputations. That seems also to me like it would be uh, helpful to the budget process. But what's what's one thing that would be awesome for you to see? Okay, can I answer first? I'll go back to it. Outcomes. Okay. I think I'd like to see what outcomes are. If we're going to spend whatever dollars is on whatever, yeah. I'd like to know. What did I get at the end of the day for it? But so, do you some think sort that's of. Is the public's role to present outcomes? Do you think, or do you think that's more of like a civil yes. service? No, I'm, How do you do it? I'm saying, you asked the question, yeah. what would I like to see? Yeah. Okay. And so, what I'm saying to you is when those budget papers come, et cetera, yeah. I'd like to see in there, in the details, yeah. what were the outcomes. So, if we spent whatever millions of dollars on something, yeah. then I wanted to go a bit further to say, well, we spent those millions of dollars to do all these things. And then to have that as a comparison as to what my expectations were that we should have we should have done as opposed to what we did. And then more also, you know, how did we do it? We have auditors, but the budget process needs to be auditing, it needs to be uh, visionary, it needs to be realistic, it needs to do all kinds of things rather than just be a political budget to throw a bunch of numbers together and say, well, well, here it is. So that would be my, you know, my I wish when we get all those notes that the board talks about. They never talk about, as I said, the example that I used, where you're giving, you know, funds to various groups and you have no idea whether, you know, what's the outcome. As I said to you, there may be new methods, new technologies, new whatever that, that says to you, you now need to shift the monies from here and put it over there. What we tend to do is, well, we got that, but you know, let's add that, let's add that. We're very difficult in, in saying, well, let's remove that. Not because we don't like you or whatever. It's, you've had your day, and now other people are doing a better job than what you used to do. So, you know, people get all excited about cuts and reductions or whatever, whatever they want to call it. I look at it and I say, well, if I want to have 500 youth employed yeah. and I can get a better return, you know, people don't like business terms, but if I can get a better return by moving that money to this group and getting 500 for the same yeah. and reducing, then I think we're further ahead because unlike some people, um, <laughs> I view every dollar that I make as mine. In, in some areas of my constituency, the average uh, income is about $40,000, $40,000 in the city of Toronto. So I also personally think at some point this, this uh, property tax business has got to die because that's not the way to, to fund anything. It's just, you know, kick out the old people out of their homes because they get a pension that they can't maintain whatever and so move them out, ship them out to a nursing home or whatever the heck it is, we can't continue in that vein. So there's, there's a whole lot of things, but right now what we're stuck with is when you ask for more, you're asking people to give up. And I, rather than asking people to give up more, I want to make sure that I do everything possible in those numbers, in those budgets, and to hold people accountable and to question. So yes, I want to know, and part of my questioning was, well, what did you do with the money? Yeah. So I could take issue with some of that, or I could find the common ground. <laughs> so, so let's find the common ground. This June, 
all of the standing committees, so the city has a series of standing committees. We have a parks and environment, a works committee, a, a community recreation committee. All of those committees are going to be hearing presentations from city staff on what we call our service standards, okay? Uh, so for example, we have a service standard that says for every uh, 100,000 people, we will have this many swing sets. I know it's absurd, but we actually have that, right? And it's the part of the analyst notes that I don't even think Mike got to. They're way at the back. It's in about six point, yeah? Okay, so, so the four of us did. Um, it's in about six point type. So get your reading glasses. Yeah. And that's actually what we should be doing at the beginning of a budget process, talking about how much of what service we want. One of the things that all of us who live in a neighborhood here I'm trying really hard not to disagree with Mike, together want to have happen in that neighborhood and are prepared to contribute to, right? And do we have enough of it? Do we have too much of it, right? Believe me, I know some people in my ward who would be really happy if there were fewer municipal licensing and standards inspectors. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who are really keen that we uh, should have more green space, more recreation facilities, more daycare spaces, and more affordable housing. So why don't we start our budget process for a change, just for once, talking about the services we want, rather than the number. Because at the end of the day, 2.5 doesn't mean anything. It's not, that doesn't tell you whether you live in a good city or whether the things that you value in your neighborhood are being invested in or forgotten. 2.5 doesn't answer that question. Uh, so I've got two ideas. Um, first is if your municipalities are not already looking for feedback at the front end of the budget process, insist on that, start asking for it, start getting involved in that, that priority setting at the front end. Um, the second is, I would love to see an army of people each take one section of the budget and scrutinize and challenge every assumption that the staff would put in there about, you know, this is what we need uh, for this service area. Um, if, if the public does not do that, it's left to councillors and uh, if they have enough staff, as some councillors do, we don't in London, um, to, uh, to challenge all, all of those things if there are any issues with it. I'll give you an example from the police budget. Um, the police budget, in, in London, all these budgets sort of drafted for August, and then we get them in December, and we're talking about them in January. So a lot of the assumptions are based on what was happening in August. Um, and if you look at fuel prices in all service areas, all these fuel uh, prices, all the budgets for fuel, were all higher uh, than the year before. And between August and January, fuel prices had dropped a lot. Propane had dropped, diesel had dropped, gas had dropped. In the police budget, they had a 27% increase for propane, right? And so, I mean, it's totally unrealistic. Now, in, that, in this case, it's very tricky for us because council can't directly get into line items of the police budget. That's going to be the police service support. But that's just an example. The same thing happened in the fire service. Uh, when it was challenged there, they dropped it by $250,000. Uh, the police just refused and were frankly uh, annoyed by the question. And, and so I, I think if, if you were to each take one section of the budget and really scrutinize it, I think that would really help councillors in identifying areas where the estimates are too high. You know, staff will come in for all various reasons about what the estimate they think. They don't want to go over budget on uh, their actual spending. So a lot of the budgets come in higher than they actually need. And at the end, you end up with a little surplus, or and then that gets allocated, you know, that's a whole other process we don't have time for. But um, mm -hmm. I, I would really love to see that. Just take each service area, get some people who are really interested in those things, who really want to dig into it, and start challenging this stuff. Thank you. Next question over here. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming today. My name is Daphne. I have a question about cash, uh, accounting on a cash basis versus accounting on a accrual basis. So, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like <laughs> for municipal budgeting. Um, so accrual accounting is pretty much what the rest of the world does. Um, you take into account your entire capital stock on a long-term basis. This is what the province and this is what the federal uh, government does. Um, and cities, in particular, uh, account on a cash basis. So you only look at your yearly expenditures and revenues uh, annually, pretty much. So it provides a good snapshot of your fiscal health, in essence. Do you think that the shift to accrual accounting, um, some would argue, 
catching up with the rest of the world, um, would help you shift um, public engagement into more of the front end, or does it just kind of complicate the process further and does it really help with citizen engagement with uh, setting priorities for what city we want to live in? Um, they can't afford approval accounting. And simply because if you, if you were to do that, the biggest um, ball chain is the uh, pension side of things. And the pension side of things um, with the defined benefits plan, which, which are no longer affordable. They are absolutely unaffordable. If you look at the unfunded liability, uh, forgetting about sick days and whatever else is out there, it's totally unaffordable. And if you were to start to accrue for that, you literally would show your books being bankrupt. So the approach has been in government is, well, we won't worry about that, but when the obligation comes forward, we will deal with it on a cash basis. So I agree with you in terms of the rest of the world, the accrual accounting is, is the right methodology because it says to you, hey, I need to set some money aside for that pension fund, okay? I can't remember, I said in Toronto last time, what was about $2.5 billion. Uh, and growing, I think. Like the numbers were staggering, absolutely staggering. Um, so the cash basis gets you out of that. But if we were truly doing what we should be doing and, and putting aside reserves and putting accruals for the day that you're going to have to pay for all this kind of stuff, you can't do it. You just can't. I think Mike and I should travel on the road and do a show. <laughs> as long as I get paid for it, I'm at forty thousand. Oh, see, see, look at that. At the trough, too long. I'm at the forty thousand uh -huh, dollar. Uh -huh. So we actually do um, both. We publish accrual accounting uh, and have it audited, and it's uh, that's part of uh, what we have to do for the bond houses. And as uh, Alex said off the top. Our, our credit rating is, is uh, AA plus. It's better than the federal government uh, or any provincial government you care to name. And that's including uh, the fact that we have uh, pensions. And by the way, those of you who don't know, it was the pension issue that was the big thing in the garbage and, and the civil uh, lockout, actually. Labor disruption in 2009. Um, I'm not one of those who thinks that uh, eliminating the ability of people to retire after a, a career of work is the way that you pay for current services, so we would disagree there. Um, and I don't think that that's disguised because of the fact that we do uh, our budgeting as a presentation of what our expenses will be for the next year. I think that we do both, and, and it's for different audiences. Yes, we have to have our eye, on our long-term liabilities, and the people who actually evaluate at the bond houses are quite happy with where Toronto is, thank you. Um, and we should also make people aware of that. The police, by the way, are the one place where we still have um, the kind of benefits Mike was talking about. We don't have that on the, the, the city side anymore. Um, but the, again, where the con it's interesting where the conversation goes. And this is why I want to say that budgets are political documents. Yes, there's a technical conversation we want to have about pensions and pension managing pensions, but uh, we don't talk about it in those terms. We talk about these big bloated pensions and these awful public servants who are going to get retirement that you don't get in the private sector, right? There's a whole language about it. And what I find very interesting is that the, the budget, that that is not a contested conversation. And that's because we have this perverse thing where the only thing we talk about is the top line. And this, I, I, if, if you, if those of you haven't figured out which note I want you to take from my presentation today, it's that the top line number is a really poor way to understand what budgeting is about. Um, so London has a triple A credit rating. Just saying. Um, but uh, you know, we, we do we do do both.
both, and it, it, it frankly can be a bit confusing. And uh, I, I, over time, the cash stuff is going to disappear entirely. Um, right now, if you were to try and reconcile what you see in the budget with what you see in the financial information return, you'd be spending a long time doing that if you weren't talking to staff, and that's why. Um, and so you have to be cautious when you're interpreting some of these documents that you know what you're looking at. Um, and for the budget purpose, I think it's fine. The way, the way we do it, we use reserve funds and all kinds of things to keep track of and save for things we need to do. Um, we have some unfunded liabilities and we have an infrastructure gap that's a bit of an issue uh, that's probably going to go to about $500 million for 50 if we don't change what we're doing. So we do keep track of those longer term things and, and as Gordon said, you know, the bond rating agencies in particular are very interested in that. We have to grab are, we are we running out of time here? Do we want to grab, grab a question from Mary here? And that would be our uh, wrap up question. I don't need a mic. Didn't think so. <laughs> for everyone else. For everyone else. No, I'm sure they'll hear me. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. I thought so. Okay. Um, I do agree that um, government has to be fiscally responsible. It makes perfect sense. But if we get stuck with things like looking at how many swing sets or whatever, are we not going to then fall by the wayside, the idea of looking at how many people are going to get emphysema or not get emphysema or get cancer or not get cancer because of what we're doing with our roads, let's say. Yeah, because you're not going to measure that at the end of June or at the end of December. That's a long-term thing. So how do you account for those sorts of things when you're doing your budgeting? That's a great question. Really easy. You can set any service standard you want. Uh, it's interesting. Um, the, the new general manager of transportation, he and I have this sort of love-hate thing, right? Because he, he's in charge of moving cars, and you know who I am. And, um, but, but he said a very interesting thing to me. Um, I was asking him for some data on something to do with transportation. And, he's, and he said to me, you probably don't want to know that, Councilor. I said, why? He said, because what you measure is what you do. Right? So we measure our tax rate, and guess what we argue about? Our tax rate. And so everything becomes about just taxes, as if they were this thing floating off in space, not related to anything. And well, if I pay them and they're big, that must be bad. So I actually would argue that we should be measuring, we should be measuring our transportation system in terms of its emissions. Suppose we had a performance standard saying there are uh, two, two and a half million trips a day, or whatever the number is, here are the emissions from those trips. We have a performance standard, a goal, uh, that we want to achieve to have that amount. And that's what's driving your public investment. Right? So I would say, Mary, that actually you and I agree here. We need to, we need to shift what it is we're counting as an outcome that we want to achieve, what it is that we're measuring, because that will make us do different things with public money. So I, I don't have a, a disagreement with that either, Gord. Um, the focus that I would, would say is this, and again, in terms of measuring outcomes as well, um, I don't think any human being wants to drink polluted water, um, breathe bad air, uh, or any of these things. I think we, we want to have as pristine an environment as we can. So the reality in our city, and again, it goes back to policy decisions and outcomes, is it takes forever to have any kind of transportation policy. There's nothing better that I would like personally than to hop on a streetcar or bus or subway or something to get me from point A to point B in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I'm, I'm up in the burbs in Scarborough. It takes me just as long by car as it does by public transportation to get to the center city core. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. So when we, when we talk about outcomes and, and, and you know, getting the benefits of cleaner air, etc., I'm 100% with you. Uh, as I was saying to one gentleman here, our problem is we tend to do things and say, well, you know what, we want to put a transportation line to whatever, we need $10 billion. And everybody, you know, it's $10 billion, we don't have the money, etc. But, you know, fundamentally, if we went to the other levels of government and said, federal, can you give me $100 million? Provincial, can you give me $100 million? We'll put in 100 million. We'll just keep tunneling. We'll just keep keep going. It's a lot easier to ask for 100 million dollars than it is for 10 billion dollars. And when you ask for 10 and nothing happens, then obviously you're going to get this 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 problem. We have a, a very significant transportation problem in the city in terms of 
You know, again, the dollars that speak for themselves in terms of productivity, in terms of, of health, in terms of all kinds of things. And yet, you know, we went through the 70s, 80s, 90s and really didn't do anything, much of anything. We sold our, our uh, machines. I can't remember whether it was for a dollar or, or what. We got rid of them. Instead of doing what other great cities in the world have been doing, London, for example, they're tunneling continually, continually. They don't look at a $10 million or $20 million. They look at, we're going to spend whatever it is, $100 million or $200 million or whatever this year, and we're going to put in. So whether, you know, the debate about a subway line or something to Scarborough, I'm going to tell you, like, there's something needed out there because I've been out there 35 years, okay? There's no incentive to hop on something to get from point A to point B. And yet, you know, if we want to make the arguments about density and all that kind of stuff, you look at where some of the subway lines are going, where the density isn't what it is in my part of town. But you know what? I don't have a problem with that. Because building more is better for all of us. And if it can get, you know, somebody in the 905 area off the streets down here that they can get into, I'm all for it. But we shouldn't just focus and stop on that particular line, and that's all we do. We need to have the longer term goals in reasonable dollar amounts and chunks. How do you need an elephant? One piece at a time, and that's what we need to do with transportation. <laughs> so, a couple of quick points. I'm glad you asked about something related to health because it lets me talk about our health units approach to budget. I'm the vice chair of public health units. Um, they have a process called program budgeting and marginal analysis, which is um, very different from what you'd see in many other uh, public sector organizations. I believe it came out of the United Kingdom originally. And they do not take anything um, for granted and they should keep doing that. They say, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve in our community in terms of health? Uh, how can we do those things? And every year they are adjusting. They, they stop doing things, they'll take a quarter full-time equivalent from here and they'll put it over there and they put it into a new program, and that is a constant process that they're always going through. They've gone from doing the most boring, um, what I would call conventional budgets uh, just two or three years ago, to fully embracing uh, PBMA as a process, and I think a lot of organizations that are in the public sector should be doing that kind of budgeting. It comes from health organizations that I think is applicable uh, to many kinds of organizations. The other piece I would add, and, and this is the example that gets at some of the stuff that was being discussed about transportation, is there are a lot of external costs that don't show up in the municipal budget and are not considered when you're, when you're, when you're deciding what you should be spending money on. And uh, I'll give you an example. It's not emissions. That's what most people think of when you start talking about externalities around transportation. I say, if I design a city where you are required to have a car to get around in a reasonable amount of time, uh, I'm saying, look, you have to spend what, eight or nine thousand dollars a year just to get around your city in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, that's really expensive. In London, uh, let's say there's two hundred ten thousand cars. Uh, if each car costs you nine thousand dollars for depreciation, maintenance, gas, insurance a year, that's like if it's a Honda Civic. They're not all Honda Civics. But that's one point nine billion dollars in private expenditure on cars in just the city of London, right? So you multiply by eight, eight or nine or ten for Toronto. Uh, that's a huge amount of money, right? That's twice our entire municipal budget, and that's just being spent on private transportation. That's a result of the policy decisions we've made in terms of how we design and build our city. Um, and th that's not captured in our municipal budget anymore. People say, oh, transit is expensive. We spent 60, or we spent $80 million on our public transit system, and that moves about 24 million riders a year. Um, that's nothing in comparison to the private expenditure of cars. And because it's not seen as a government decision, Right? People feel like they're spending their own money on cars and making that decision themselves. Well, we've made people have to buy cars that way. Like that's the, that's the result of a lot of decisions we made over many decades, and that's the kind of city we have. And it's a really expensive kind of city. So if you're concerned about costs and you want to do things differently, sometimes that means you need to spend more money in the public sector on public transit, and less, and it's going to save so much more money at the pure private. <laughs> Thank you very much to our panelists for joining us this morning. We really appreciate you coming in and having this discussion with us.